kangaroos have this pouch where they can carry around all kinds of things, their babies. And I figured that would be a good mascot for lawmakers so that they can continue to hold all the unregulated campaign donations that they receive. Ah. <laughs> So tell me, does that not explain politics? I don't know, man. But like a butterfly sting like a bee. He really doesn't give a crap about dealing with racism. On this episode of Pod Virginia. It's kind of caused a bit of a stir. A crossover episode with our friends at Bold Dominion. It's almost like she's trying to do a Ronald Reagan moment, like Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Yeah. We review the General Assembly session as a game show. That is concerning. <laughs> We're joined by the host of Bold Dominion, Nathan Moore, and the producer of Bold Dominion, Catherine Hansen. Well, all my time monitoring Twitter has finally paid off, Michael. The price is right for this game show, so make all your answers in the form of a question for this episode of Pod Virginia. Support for Pod Virginia comes from the Virginia Poverty Law Center. Using advocacy, education, and litigation to dismantle systemic barriers trapping Virginians in poverty, and the League of Conservation Voters Education Fund, building a stronger conservation voter movement to protect the natural environment and improve the quality of life for all Virginians, and Dominion Energy, dedicated to delivering reliable, affordable, clean energy, protecting the environment, serving customers, empowering people, and creating value for shareholders and from Patreons who are listeners like you. I'm Michael Pope. I'm Tom Bowman. And this is Pod Virginia. We've got something special for you this week. A treat to celebrate the end of the General Assembly session. Signy Die, a crossover episode with our friends at Bold Dominion. Thomas, you just pronounced Signy Die the way the Senate pronounces it, not the way the House pronounces it. Or the way... The Romans would have pronounced it, uh, Sine Die. Yeah, well, uh, this crossover episode that you're about to hear, it's not just any crossover episode. It's actually a game show. A game show, huh? Yeah, we thought it would be a fun way to use sound clips as a springboard to talk about what happened or what didn't happen in the General Assembly session. All right, so don't blame me. This was Michael's idea. Yes, it was my idea. And listen, we had a great time with our friends from Bold Dominion. So let's get to it. Well, the General Assembly session is over, and all we have left is the memories and, of course, some audio. So we're going to dig into that audio now and hold a friendly competition between Bold Dominion and Pod Virginia. Now, the rules are pretty simple. Each answer will get you one point or maybe no points or it doesn't really matter because this is actually just a fun game to talk about the General Assembly session. Is all that clear enough? Uh, it's uh, as clear as my coffee. <laughs> Okay, let's meet the contestants. First up, we've got the host of Bold Dominion, Nathan Moore. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. We are also joined by the producer of Bold Dominion, Catherine Hansen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Plus, we're joined by the co-host of Pod Virginia, Thomas Bowman. Thanks for joining us. Great to be back. This is such a surprise. <laughs> Okay, let's get right into this and play the game. Our first bit of audio is from the Speaker of the House of Delegates, Todd Gilbert. He is cheered by those who called for his resignation, repeatedly cheered by those who called for his resignation. So I've grown weary of being lectured by matters uh, of race by, by Ralph Northam. That's Speaker Gilbert trashing Governor Ralph Northam after his final State of the Commonwealth address. Now, Speaker Gilbert caused a firestorm by tweeting during the speech, describing Governor Northam as condescendingly lecturing lawmakers because he read what book? Nathan, I'm going to start with you. My guess is uh, uh, it's Beloved by Toni Morrison, since that was uh, what Republicans were all running against uh, as their opponent last fall. It is interesting how beloved that Toni Morrison book actually featured so prominently in the campaign last year and in the session this year. And the beloved bill actually got through the democratically controlled Senate and is now on the governor's desk. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good guess. Well, and just to explain it there, that, that bill then would basically let parents opt their kids out of, of learning certain subjects, right? Or, or, or reading certain books that are part of a curriculum otherwise. 
it would require the school division to notify parents when they were going to teach anything with sexually explicit material. So beloved would qualify. If you talk to teachers, though, they will say anytime you have to notify parents, that's kind of a non-starter. So school systems will avoid teaching beloved in favor of teaching something that does not require notification. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like a it's like a um, a way to ban a book without directly banning it. It's like an indirect ban. Yeah, it's like, book, a, like a chilling effect. Yeah, right. So, Catherine Hansen, I'm going to go to you next. What do you think, what kind of book do you think Speaker Gilbert might have been talking about there in, in terms of what Governor Northam was reading? First thing that comes to mind is white fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. Do you think that that Northam either read that book or should have read that book? I'm kind of thinking you may have read it. From my understanding, I have not read the book, but it's kind of caused a bit of a stir. I don't think that it got across the message that it wanted to. I think it's something that Governor Ralph Northam, Northam probably read, and maybe that's why it's being criticized. Well, you know, actually, if you think about the the blackface scandal as being a fulcrum that sort of changed the direction of the Northam administration, I would say the sort of post-blackface era was sort of organized around that kind of thinking, right? And he tried to make this his legacy, fighting against systemic racism. Uh, in fact, it was that part of the speech that the speaker was specifically commenting about. So that's that's probably a pretty good guess. I think that white fragility was another one I thought of. Maybe that's the one that, that Gilbert's referencing. I don't know if Gil I also thought maybe it would be uh, How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Um, somehow I don't think Todd Gilbert knows a lick about either of those books. Um, in his one tweet, you know, he, he managed to not just basically tell Ralph Northam to not let the screen door hit his ass on the way out, he also managed to show off in one sentence how he really doesn't give a crap about about dealing with racism and thinks that the needs of black Virginians should be trivialized. So, you know, I don't think uh, Gilbert has read Ibram Kendi or or um, uh, or White Fragility um, or any of the other books. But you're right on that on that pivot point with the North administration. He um, kind of started his his term as this sort of like all shucks, you know, Virginia politician. And then when that came out, he really did some work, you know. Um, and really tried to, to grow as a person. And I really applaud him for that. Thomas Bowman, what book do you think the speaker might have been talking about there? Well, all my time monitoring Twitter has finally paid off, Michael, because the answer is Roots, a much more dated <laughs> reference, which makes more sense for coming from Speaker Todd Gilbert than any of the wonderful guesses, uh, although Beloved was the right era, any of the wonderful guesses uh, that all the other contestants had. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the 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 guesses that we just talked about were, for the most part, much more modern. Uh, Roots is a sort of 1970s era book, um, but it obviously made an impression. Roots also had, of course, a television series associated with it. So it was not just a book, but also kind of a media environment of its own. Um, OK, all right. So this session saw a lot of changes in terms of covid protocol. Here's Senator Siobhan Donovan talking about the plexiglass barriers installed around the Senate desks. I would like this box removed from my desk by Monday. I can remove it myself and I will do that if there's not the manpower to do that. But I um, I think that that is the right thing to do, and I would like to proceed without this box around my desk for the last two weeks of session. I probably wasn't the only person that was hoping that I could watch Senator Donovan rip down that box with her bare hands, although that didn't happen. Instead, the clerk's office removed all those plexiglass barriers, and the Senate started looking like it did in the old days. Now, I question about those plexiglass boxes. Many senators decorated their plastic shields with decals of a specific animal. What was the animal and what is its significance? Catherine H Hansen, I'm going to start with you. What animal do you think the senators might have put on their plexiglass shields as kind of a metaphor for this General Assembly session? You know, I don't know if this is the right answer, but I've seen some pictures on Twitter of decals of butterflies on plexiglass shields. Ding, 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 ding. Butterfly okay, actually okay, is the correct, correct answer. Um, first thing that comes to mind is float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, but maybe they're looking about going through some sort of metamorphosis in Virginia politics right now. 
pretty deep, or they might have just had decals of butterflies lying around. <laughs> I'll tell you, my guess actually uh, was going to be a kangaroo because it has a really big pouch. You know, kangaroos have this pouch where they can carry around all kinds of things, their babies. And I figured that would be a good mascot for lawmakers so that they can continue to hold all the unregulated campaign donations that they receive. Ah, <laughs> uh, I like you it. Know, there was a bill like earlier this year, we covered it on Bold Dominion, to uh, regulate Dominion, to, to prohibit utilities from donating to uh, uh, campaigns in a big way during, um, you know, about things that they would... <laughs> <laughs> be impacted by directly. Of course, that failed. Uh, there was even a bill that was really basic campaign finance reform that would have prohibited lawmakers from using campaign donations for personal expenses. So you get a bunch of campaign money used to pay your phone bill or send your kid to college or whatever. That failed. So it's like, I mean, Virginia is just like completely, the, the lawmakers just love going to that trough and just feeding and feeding and feeding. All right. Well, moving over to the pandemic, we may be over COVID protocol, but COVID-19 is not done with us yet. As a result, lawmakers heard a number of bills responding to the pandemic, everything from restricting the emergency powers of the governor to allowing local governments to meet virtually. This was discussed in the Senate Health Committee and Chairwoman Louise Lucas had a hard time handling the situation in the room. Here's part of that audio. I would ask that you will very politely leave the room so that others might come in to, so that their bill can be heard. Thank you very My much. My husband is in the hospital right now. I'm sorry, ma'am. This bill is passed by indefinitely. Could those of you who are here on that bill please leave the this room? Is too important of a topic. So as you could hear there in the audio, people in that room had somehow come to believe that ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were some kind of miracle cure. And so that was the conflict you were hearing there in the room, is that the senators had killed the bill uh, allowing doctors to prescribe ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, and the people in the room were very unhappy about it. So let's talk about junk science. If you were going to prescribe a miracle cure for a condition, what would you prescribe and what would the medication accomplish? Catherine Hansen, I'm going to start with you. I immediately think of like women's reproductive issues, like endometriosis or PCOS right now. Like... Maybe some sort of pill you could take that would come up with a cure immediately. I feel like those are two examples of like reproductive health issues that often go unnoticed, like especially in black women and women of color who are just assumed to have a higher pain tolerance. So I think if we could just have a, a one and done cure for those women, that would that would be ideal. That's a pretty good answer. Uh, Thomas Bowen, I'm going to go to you on miracle cures. All right. I would have a miracle cure for generational lead poisoning. So a report just came out in March saying that for all Americans, 54% of the Americans alive in 2015 had, ex had been exposed to dangerous levels of lead as children. That's over 170 million adults now at risk of neurodegenerative diseases like mental illness and uh, lower IQ points, and it impedes brain development and permanent learning difficulties and most importantly, behavioral issues. So tell me, does that not explain politics if 54% of Americans have this incredibly toxic, uncurable lead poisoning? <laughs> Nathan Moore, what's your answer on a miracle cure for the General Assembly? Legal weed. <laughs> Uh, no, no, for all, mellow. For, all, for all sorts of ailments. And I'm not actually just uh, talking about the uh, actual health uses of cannabis, although there's a lot of research about that. No, there's um, earlier uh, in the session, I, I talked with the Marijuana Justice Executive Director, Chelsea Higgs Wise, and you know, she talked about a few things that really do need to happen as the state legalizes cannabis to do it in, in a way that, that promotes the Commonwealth, like the people of the Commonwealth and not just the big money players. Um, the first one is happening. It's stop the harm, you know, stop arresting people for simple possession. And so that that happened and that's happening. Um, but then she also uh, very much uh, talks about the need to um, continue building this cannabis control authority and uh, cannabis equity reinvestment fund. Don't just start selling cannabis at ABC stores, but actually have um, – uh, go into this with our eyes open about how we can uh, redirect uh, the cannabis revenue that the state collects and reinvest that in the people that were directly impacted by the drug war. 
Um, and so that that those are bills that that passed when the Democrats held the assembly. And actually, I want to ask you, Michael and Thomas, because you know more about exactly what passed this session. What what happened with this? Is this still how it's going, or is that all repealed? Now it's just what's going on. So it's interesting you brought up that idea of using the creation of a new cannabis industry to address the harms created by the war on drugs, because that was actually something the Democrats were really interested in when they were in power, creating social equity licenses. So there's a lot of money that will, that somebody's going to make when marijuana is finally legalized. So the idea behind the social equity licenses is that you give priority licenses, so early licenses, to people who have been arrested on marijuana misdemeanor charges, or even relatives of people who have been arrested and you know, uh, it served time in jail under marijuana misdemeanor charges. The Republicans hated that idea. They really did. And they sort of clashed over this And I actually kind of thought I saw a compromise emerge where they got rid of all the social equity licenses in favor of doing licenses for areas that had been economically disadvantaged, Uh, which, of course, there's crossover there. I mean, like the there's lots of areas that are economically disadvantaged where police also disproportionately arrested people for marijuana charges. So um, that was a compromise that kind of was emerging. But at the end of the day, the Republican caucus just could not see themselves creating an industry for marijuana. So the whole thing went up in smoke. Um, All right. Now, moving on to the environment, Governor Glenn Youngkin wanted to appoint the Trump EPA chief to run Virginia's environmental programs, appearing before a hostile crowd of Senate Democrats on the Environmental Committee. Andrew Wheeler said people just didn't understand what he was up to at the EPA because the media is so awful. They don't report that my number one project for that company was advocating for the Miners Protection Act to shore up the retirement and health care benefits of the United Mine Workers. Okay, so let's bash the media. What's the most dangerous media information out there right right now? How is the media getting it wrong? Uh, Or maybe how are some in the media getting it wrong? Thomas Bowman, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Well, immediately offhand, I think uh, Fox News and right wing media generally, especially the most dangerous misinformation being on COVID, uh, shortly followed thereafter by various right wing conspiracies being inflamed by the Kremlin. You know, January 6th is pretty much a disaster. Um, But on COVID, the pandemic is not over until the World Health Organization says officially that it is over. And until then, uh, a pandemic means that uh, the virus or or the disease evolves in unpredictable ways and um, can, can come and go. So it should be very simple. If pandemic, then wear your mask. If no pandemic, then refer to local authorities. Nathan Moore, what is the most dangerous media misinformation out there right now? Well, Thomas pointed out Fox News, which is certainly the 500 pound gorilla of uh, sort of right wing misinformation at the national level. You know, the thing is, it it wouldn't be so amplified without uh, social media as well and all the shares that that people do in the unchecked way that that non facts and, and frankly, dangerous misinformation does get shared around and, and amplified and, and people start thinking it's real. And I just want to point out to you, you know, this is the way authoritarian uh, regimes thrive is, is, or authoritarian movements is, you know, they, they start pointing out like, oh, that's not real. They, they, they start pushing forward different versions of a big lie. And, and it's not so much that people all believe the big lie, but it, they start to, uh, enough people start to think, well, we can't trust any of it. It's all, it's all not true. And when that happens then the authoritarians just use raw power and it doesn't matter what the facts are. And that's exactly what we saw during the Trump regime. It's not that people all believe Trump, although far too many did. Uh, it's that they just push forward this big lie so much uh, that that you know before long, you know, an average sort of not Politico follower, you know, like, who knows what's real? I'm just going to check out of the whole thing, and that's fertile ground for for actual authoritarians to take over. Um, it's made possible by social media and and very very well healed national outlets like Fox News and others. Now that said, I, I think. I, I don't know that I would call them the uh, uh, most dangerous misinformation right now, but um, I am, though, I've been in Virginia long enough to have have uh, become very disappointed in where um, one state outlet has gone, and that's Bacon's Rebellion. Um, you know, it, it used mm. to be, 
nuanced conversation across the political spectrum. I mean, it, it leaned right of center, but it was thoughtful, you know, and I actually went there for other perspectives than my own. I thought it was good. Um, now in the last couple of years, uh, you know, it's really just now the dominion of, of white boomer men with grievances against wokeness. And, and I'm really saddened by, by where they've gone. Catherine Hansen, what's the most dangerous form of media misinformation out there from your perspective? I think to look at a state level, uh, critical race theory and the state of education policy in Virginia. We recently did an episode on this uh, two weeks ago, and both of our guests let us know that parents have already had avenues to go into schools and discuss what their children are learning. I mean, lesson plans are posted online. So this idea that you know, parents have no say in what their children are learning and that, you know, that even that they're learning critical race theory when they're not, it's a law school concept. So I guess the idea that, you know, you have to vote on these really heavy issues and parents have already had the avenues to do this and really aren't taking advantage of them. I, I think it's causing a lot of anger and a lot of stir up from parents over an issue that really they, they've, they've already have an, they have already had an avenue to sort of resolve if they had a problem with it. All right, this game is not over yet. Pod Virginia is clearly in the lead, but our friends from Bold Dominion may be catching up on us. Let's take a quick break so we can pay our bills. We'll be right back. This is Delegate Emily Brewer. You're listening to Pod Virginia, one of the best podcasts in the Commonwealth with Michael Pope and Thomas Bowman. All right, so let's move on to our final question. Let's talk about words. How we talk about things influences how we think about them. So social equity license might be a hard sell because the word equity has kind of fallen out of favor with Republicans. Another good example is the Department of Corrections. They say they don't put prisoners in isolated confinement because they don't call it isolated confinement. They call it restrictive housing. And then last summer, they stopped calling it restrictive housing in favor of calling it restorative housing. Kim Bobo at the Virginia Poverty Law Center said this is a debate about language. I think they're playing games with words. They do use restrictive housing. They use restorative housing. They have all these fancy names, but essentially it is still solitary confinement. People are being isolated for long periods of time. The lawmakers, Some lawmakers were trying to ban Virginia prisons from having isolated confinement. That issue failed in favor of having a study. They're going to study it, and maybe next year they'll do something. Maybe they, next year they won't. Um, so the concept, isolated confinement, the words isolated confinement, well, that really needs a makeover, but it's not alone. What phrase or name is misleading? Things like right to work. Um, what phrase or words need a makeover, maybe. Nathan Moore, I'm going to start with you. Uh, so there's two that I want to use as a springboard to talk about something else. Right to work is one. Uh, it's really the right to work for less, because what that means when you say right to work is that uh, it basically makes union representation very difficult. Historically and in the present day, unions are pretty much the only thing that workers have to keep from being exploited by their bosses, to keep from working in unsafe conditions, to keep from, you know, having to have their entire days and nights turned over to their to their employee to their employer just to be just a machine that works and that's all and i will say this all the time like uh, not saying unions always make good decisions they are human institutions and they make mistakes but unions as a concept unions as a thing that we need in virginia i am a hundred percent there um so right to work is definitely one that needs a, a makeover another one is is critical race theory or quote divisive concepts that was a funny one this session um almost like so broad as to be meaningless whereas critical race theory is so narrow as to be uh misleading um both of those point to really education policy right now virginia education policy does need to really come around and recognize and, and remember that public education in this state is really the foundation and cornerstone of having a democratic society here. Um, I mean, going back to just after the Civil War, it was required by the federal government in Reconstruction for Southern states to set up good public education systems because they knew that would actually make democracy possible. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. Um, and we've got teachers now here throughout the state who are trying to, to do good work. Uh, a lot of them are leaving the field because there is so much ridiculousness and the pay is, is so 
meager for all the the difficulties they have to put up with from all sides. And um, Catherine mentioned earlier the episode we did on this at Bold Dominion, but you know there is a crisis in teaching right now where we've got a, a teacher shortages in a lot of regions. Definitely substitute teacher shortages, even here in Charlottesville, which is a relatively a uh, um, attractive place to be a teacher compared to some places. Um, you know, the, the bus driver shortage is making it so that kids go to the bus stop and maybe they just don't get picked up sometimes, you know? I mean, we've got some real systemic problems here. The, uh, the, the fabric that holds together a core institution of our democracy is really fraying. And we got to, we got to recognize teacher unions and we got to, uh, you know, respect the field, respect the profession and let teachers do their damn jobs and do it well. Cause they're gonna, we train them well and we let them do their thing as professionals. All right. So the Virginia Department of Corrections clearly believes that isolated confinement as a phrase needs a makeover. Catherine Hansen, what's your thought on a phrase or a word that clearly needs a makeover? I guess maybe this isn't a super recent or relevant one, and I don't necessarily think it needs a makeover so much as to be abolished, but pull yourself up by the bootstraps is not only physically impossible, but sort of places the onus on the individuals to pick themselves up instead of being able to have a government that supports them. So that's that's one that I have a certain issue with. Hmm. Thomas Bowman, what's your thought on a word or phrase that needs a makeover? All right. What the phrase that most needs to die in Virginia politics is peace in the valley. And I have a good reason for that. <laughs> uh, I tell, who, who uses that a lot? Tell me more. A lot of Virginia legislators on both sides use that a lot. Um, it's a pretty common phrase you'll hear during legislative session to describe when when there's no more objections to a particular bill. Here's why it needs to go away. Because there's there's a famous Prussian military general called Karl von Clausewitz. He said in his treatise on war, uh, war is politics by other means. So there can be no peace when politics is war by other means. Uh, and and if one thing uh, in the at least since 2016 has been made painfully clear to me is that the civil war in America never ended. The Confederates changed their tactics, and so this is a multi generational story and conflict. And we cannot let our guard down. We cannot assume that uh, we can't. We all just get along. That is not how this works. Uh, you fight when neither side can gain sufficient political advantage. One thing that we've heard a lot recently, especially during the General Assembly session, is the Virginia way, this like archaic principle that's hindering a lot of progress, especially in the way of like campaign finance reform. So I think if there's anything that needs a makeover, it's, you know, 200 years of holding on to the same principle that, that really doesn't apply now and is, is hindering a lot of the work that we could be doing. Yeah, also really vague, too, because Virginia Way means different things to different people. I mean, almost literally every time I hear that phrase, it's it's used to describe something different than the previous time I heard it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it actually it, it's it's almost like critical race theory in that way is that it's it means something to, in the mind of the person who's saying it that's not at all tied to how everyone else wants to define it. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I, I would I would chime in to say the word that I think needs a makeover is the word guardrails. During this session, we heard tons of discussion. This needs guardrails and that needs guardrails and everything needs guardrails. And in fact, Speaker Todd Gilbert made a joke at the very, very end of the session, right before they adjourned, that he was joking about the bingo cards. You know, like during the General Assembly session, everybody, all the staffers have these bingo cards. And then, you know, as certain things happen, they, you know, they cross off the that square. And so the speaker made a joke um, that the word guardrails was like instant bingo because everyone, everyone is constantly talking about guardrails all the time. Um, so that uh, that would be my suggestion for a word or a phrase that needs a makeover. All right. Now, I have been dutifully keeping score as we have been playing this game, ladies and gentlemen, and I've got a winner. I'm going to declare the winner is you, the listener of our crossover podcast for listening to all of our discussion on all these things. I want to say thank you to our contestants, Nathan Moore, the host of Bold Dominion, Catherine Hansen, the producer of Bold Dominion, and Thomas Bowman, the co-host of Pod Virginia. Thank you all. Michael, thank you so much for uh, for hosting the show. It's it's uh, been a pleasure to uh, have the crossover. 
Pod Virginia is a production of Jackleg Media. Our producer is Arian Ballou. Our social media manager is Emily Cottrell. And our advertising sales manager is David O'Connell. Find us on Facebook or Twitter. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And hey, write a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. We'll be back next week with another episode of Pod Virginia.